All right, uh, Peter, if you can, please, um, you can share um, a copy of the PDF with the team. Uh, that will be most appreciated. Then we can kick off. So I've just shared the link with you on the chat. If you can pick it up from there, you can just confirm if it's all good. Evening, everyone. Okay, let me do so, Randani. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let me just uh, maybe project uh, my cam my camera or open my camera now just for the beginning of the session. So just uh, as a way of introduction, my name is Serendani and I'll be the one um, taking you through E3. Uh, so my colleague will come in later. Uh, when he looks at um, the digital strategies. But most of the sessions that we're going to have, we're going to have them together. So because this is our first session, I always want to touch on some crucial aspect in order to just really unpack how one needs to, to be learning this particular module, uh, the best way to study for it, and just to remember what um, or keep in mind what is then expected of us in this particular module and it's always quite important to to remember that there are two key things we are looking to achieve here firstly it is um it is your success in the objective test if you are required to write the objective test and then it's your success in the case study uh, which everyone is required to write regardless of a or point of entry. And when it comes to strategy, this is really uh, the last milestone uh, that you will need to overcome from an assessment perspective before you qualify as a CGMA, a CMA. So that is really the idea uh, for E3. So I'm going to just give you a high level of what we are going to cover throughout. And we're then just going to jump in into E3A, which is E3 section A of the syllabus. So as I've said, uh, my name is uh, Rendani, and I'll be taking you about um, five of the six uh, uh, sections of E3 paper whereas my colleague will then be taking you through E3F, which is Musizi right there. And just to have an overview of how the E3 syllabus looks like and what you therefore need to know as an imperative. So these are the six sections in E3. And as you can see, they've got different weightings. The smallest one being 50% and the biggest or highest being 20%. And this right here just talks about the content that we'll need to cover throughout the course. And looking at this, um, when we look talk about um, the respective percentages, we can see that um, the topic we're going to look at under section A uh, will then have 15% of what? Of the syllabus. So this will give you a rough idea of the content that you will need to cover throughout the course. But I'm confident that tonight we'll be able to start and finish what we need to do. Then the second part, it's all about organizational ecosystem. Very interesting topic and dealing with some of the aspects which we are seeing in a modern day and age. Then we're going to talk about something which is crucial when it comes to strategy. How do you generate strategic options? Remember, strategies are all about a course of action to achieve an objective. So if I say that we are generating strategic object, option, we need to keep the objectives in mind, which is something that we're going to be speaking about because the strategy process, if it is to meet objective, we need to start there. What are the objective? 
what is a strategy. Then once we have laid down all the strategic options, the next thing is really to choose which one. And the reality of choice is the same that we face in real life, that I can be interested in so many things, but I will only be limited to some of those things because of the resources that I've got, because there's limited time in the world, because there's limited finances, because there are only uh, so many competent people out there that I can be able to attract into my firm and be able to work with them to achieve those strategies. So these are the kind of things that we are going to be dealing with under strategic choices. Then strategic control really says that, okay, you've implemented the strategy. How is it working? Uh, what do you need to do to get it back into what? To get it back into on track. And then we will jump in into strategy, digital strategies where we will unpack topics such as what? Topics such as strategic networks, strategic platforms, and just digital uh, or disruptive business strategies right there. So that is the entire syllabus. And I've broken it down in more detail here as captured by SEMA. So this is very important because one needs to be able to understand what are they doing here? What, why does E3 essentially exist as part of the syllabus? We need to be clear and we need to be mindful of that. So this right here, I will always come back to it in each and every lesson of ours so that we keep in mind why we are here. And the biggest thing about it is that we need to understand strategy. We need to be able to develop, evaluate, uh, generate, uh, and review and control the different strategies. That is what it's all about. And these are the kind of things that at the end, and when we get to the case that we will be emphasizing that decision making capabilities okay then it is also important that when we talk about the objective test those are the tests that will require us to know things so there are a significant um they are significant amount of theory or the significant amount of theory that will need to go through. There are different terminologies that I will introduce you to. And afterwards, you will then have the ability to do it, the ability to unpack those. But I don't want it to just be a one man show or a one sided conversation. I also want to hear from your views about maybe some of the things you've seen there, maybe the things that you work with on a daily basis, just to be able to bring practicality in some of what of our discussion here. And as you can see from this outline here, this syllabus, it's um, or the, the number of chapters that we have to go through, they are substantially a lot, but the key themes coming from them are usually quite clear and therefore makes navigating the syllabus to be quite a breeze. And I'm hoping that as we do so, that is something that you'll come to recognize and therefore you'll come um, to, to, to really benefit from. So, so, so that is um, essentially uh, our starting point. So I, I'm not sure if there's anything that you want to just check in before we jump into it. Are there any questions, any points of clarity about what we are doing here as part of E3 about um, the what? 
about uh, what we are going to be able to achieve by the time we are done with this. Any question? All good. Hi, Randon. No, all good from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Or oh, is it Tavisa? Okay, I don't know which bank was open. <laughs> it was me or, or Sim. <laughs> or Sim. Okay, sure, cool. Yeah, sure, I don't know. Sure. sure. All right, so let's get into it. So, so this is a very interesting model um, and a uh, module, and I hope that you get to enjoy it because for me, uh, what, 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 where, where I see it quite fitting is just the exposure to to see the world in a different from a different perspective. Tip, to say that a lot of the things that we're going to speak about here, uh, I, I, I'm almost secured or guaranteed that you would have engaged with them, you will have thought about them, you will have been exposed to them, but maybe the theory behind it, maybe what it took to get here was not absolutely what was not absolutely clear, that you might have made some purchase decision having been influenced by some of these things, you might have come to be associated with particular brands because they've managed to what? They've managed uh, to, they've managed to, uh, to, 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 to really uh, execute on some of the things that we're going to be speaking about very, very uh, brilliantly. And that's what it's all about strategy because it, it focuses on meeting the customer's needs. And we're going to talk about those in different contexts. We talk about stakeholders, where we talk about objectives, and so on and so on. So in, in different contexts, we will then be what? We will then be uh, thinking and being mindful uh, about a lot of things in the real world. And that brings me to the next point, to say that if you are to study for this module, don't just study it from a theoretical perspective, but it might require you to, to go a little bit out and a little bit extra and read widely and, and understand the things that uh, we, when you see a company saying that, no, it just decided to acquire this other company, just read and say, what, well, how are they convincing stakeholders that this is a good idea? Are they talking about uh, their strategic objective? Are they talking about uh, their mission? Are they talking about uh, what? What is it? And you will find that a lot of the themes are going to be what? Are going to be evident because this strategy is all about. It's all about making decisions. And we make decision given our limited constraint. We make decision given a particular environment and given a number of what? Given a number of things. So let us do what? Uh, let me just project. I think it disconnected me. Okay, should be back down. All right. 
Right, let's go for it. So the first chapter in our syllabus, it's um, the strategy process. The strategy process. And what we're going to be focused on here, we are going to be focused on the purpose of strategy. Because this term sometimes is loose, it's, it's thrown around quite loosely uh, to say this is the, the strategy. We speak about it in the context of sports. We speak about it in the context of almost everything that his strategy was this, his strategy was that, their team strategy was this. But really, when we talk about the strategy process uh, in the context of an organization, what are we thinking about? All right. And what we are therefore going to unpack in this particular chapter are this uh, and the next are these three things. One, you will then be expected to explain the purpose of strategy. And for you to do that, it means you need to be able to define strategy and explain its purpose. And in doing so, we're going to discuss the different definition of strategies of strategy and also essential features as well as characteristics of strategy. That's our first objective or outcome. And the second outcome after covering these two chapters, you are going to be able to discuss the different types and level of strategy. And we're going to talk about what we call the rational model of strategy, which if um, you have done any strategic course or any strategy material, it is the one that you will have found that they will have spoken to you about. Then we're going to talk about then your uh, the third outcome will be for you to outline the strategy process. And we will then talk about um, how, what does it mean when we say strategic choice? strategy control, generating options. So these will then lay the foundations of what we're going to be dealing with in E3. So this particular chapter, as well as the next, are crucial because when it comes to evaluating strategy, we're going to be talking about the things we've learned here, that what is your mission though? How are you developing your strategy? Are you using this approach or the other approach? and so on and so on. Then when we look at the representative task when it comes to the objective test, so the objective test then says that, OK, going into it, what is it that the examiners expect of you? So the examiners expect you to be able to analyze the advantages and disadvantages of strategy development. So should you even bother to develop strategy? What if you do not? Then the next one it is what? The purpose of strategy. And remember, or oh, you should at this point be linking it back to this. So one out outcome number one is to explain the purpose of strategy. And then they're breaking it down to just say how or what is then the expectation? So the expectation is to analyze the essential features and characteristics of strategy, including the long-term horizon, considering the organization as a whole, stakeholder analysis, gaining sustainable competitive advantage and environmental analysis. Then, Number two, when it comes to explaining the purpose of strategy, we said it is the types and the levels. So we're going to understand that strategy, when we speak about it, it could be a corporate strategy, which you might have seen from, say, your organization. Then if you are part of a division, there could be a divisionalized or divisional strategy or business unit strategy. And there could then be a function like a finance function, corporate service, marketing, they will also have their strategy. And that's where we talk about functional strategies. Then when we talk about the different approaches, we will then talk about the rational, emergent, incrementalism, and freewheeling 
opportunism. So those are the types of strategies. And this right here, as you can see, it's the checklist that you need to use in order to just make sure before I move from this particular topic, did I tick the boxes? And lastly, in with regards to outcome number three, it is to do what? It is to analyze the ecosystem uh, strategic options and choice and implementation. But this is some of the bigger parts. So we're just going to briefly touch on it now. But when we go to strategic choices, strategic implementation, review and control, we're going to come back to it in much more detail. OK. Then the purpose of strategy, the first leg. So what is strategy? If one asks you, what is strategy? How will you define it? In your own words, maybe if, let me hear from you. If I ask you, what is strategy? How will you go about defining it? How will you go about defining it? Anyone, I just want to hear from you. How will you go about defining strategy? If someone says, do you have a strategy to be a CGMA? Do you have a strategy to be a CA? Do you have a strategy to be a director or partner? Well, what, what are they asking you? How, how do you, how do you, how will you respond? How will you respond? I just want to hear from you. Should you? Please. Uh, and so a strategy is um, mm -hmm. it's sort of a to-do list of, of what you're going to do to achieve uh, an objective. Okay, so, so, so that means you will start with, I want to do something, and the strategy is like, in order to get there, this is my to-do list. I need to do one, two, three, four, five. Is that what yes. you say? All right. Yes. Cool. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. Simo, you want to add or give a different perspective? I think it's more about adding, Mirindan. I think from okay. my side, when yes. we're talking strategy, mm -hmm. I think it begins with me identifying point A, which is where I am, yeah. and point B, which is where I want to go. And mm -hmm. then the plan, mm -hmm. a very detailed plan in between me moving from where I am to where mm -hmm. I want to be would be what I would call my strategy to say. From here, I know I need to mm -hmm. do this and this and this, like a detailed plan is, to, let's say for example, I have a Monday and a Friday. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying my point here is Monday and I want to get to Friday. Mm -hmm. And then my strategy will be what do I do on Monday to make sure that I get a chance to also get to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then subsequently to my desired place, which is then Friday. So that will be what I, will, I look at strategy as. And, and that, that, that's essentially that. So, so, so very much aligned. So, and it's all about that. And I will not want you to complicate it as well here. Because you, you will see that, yes, we can talk about some of this business terminology, but at the end of the day, it's all about um, a course of action, a to-do list, as you put it, a detailed plan of how to move from here to there. But generally speaking, we, we speak about strategy when we are thinking about more of a long term. Uh, because sometimes it, this strategy could be very broad. Um, when now, when we talk about detail, yes, we'll talk about the critical things that we need to have in order to get to somewhere. And, and, and as you all of you are saying, the, the crucial elements about what you've said, if I'm to take away, will be one, to devise a strategy without knowing where you are going 
it can be difficult. But as we'll see later on, there are some strategies that are very what that are very uh, iffy when it comes to where is tomorrow. And that is one of the biggest criticism that you can't run your organization as if tomorrow is not going to exist. But there is there are different schools of thought around that which we are going to explain. But both of you said one, there is somewhere you want to go. And two, the strategy, it's your way of getting there. And that's the official strategy from SEMA. So SEMA uh, ha have got what they've got their playbook or yeah, their way of doing things like a strategy book. And in there, they define it as a course of action. What you want to do, as you were saying, including the specification of the resources needed. So, so when you say detailed plan, it's a matter of if I need to get to next week, I need a car, I need uh, to make sure this car is enough petrol. So those are the kind of things when we talk about resources required. So we should not be just saying that uh, I, I want to be, or I want to do this, but it is not clear in terms of the how. Because if it's not clear of the how, it becomes very difficult to then execute on that strategy. Then the the another way to look at it is really it's a direction and scope of an organization over the long term. But remember that from an organizational perspective, we want to do what we want to continue to exist. That, that's what makes a, 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 a company a company. A company wants to continue to exist. That, that's like it's embedded. And But now the question is, why does it exist? It exists to fulfill particular needs or objectives. But because the company is not a person, it does not wake up like us and we have needs that we need to what we need to satisfy. We need to work towards. So the company has to have goals, but those goals are then influenced by what? Are then influenced by its stakeholders. So essentially, when we talk about strategy, it is a way to meet the objective or the needs of what? Of our stakeholders. And we'll then get to understand that when we talk about stakeholders, stakeholders are very broad. But we are saying ultimately it is that course of action that we will we'll need to put in order to ensure we fulfill the what the stakeholders expectation. And as it will become clearer here, is that in order to then do it in order to have strategy. You've seen, Simo said it very nicely to say, we will need to consider where we are. And even an organization has to do that. It has to stop and say that it is here. What resources does it have? In other words, does it have vehicles that it needs? Does it have the money? Does it have the people? Does it have, because to put a strategy that does not really talk to who you are might not make sense. You will need to be able to understand your resources, to understand who you are working with, understand who you are trying to serve. And that's what will be important for what for coming up with strategies of a company. And, and, and we're going to talk about the formal terminology of what is it when we say that we are assessing the organization's resources, uh, its uh, environment, its uh, participants, its stakeholders? What does that mean? How does that work? Then one of the things about it is that, OK, if we are saying that this plan that we're going to devise, it just doesn't come out of nowhere. Like, for instance, if today I don't have a car and I don't have money, I cannot be planning on doing something tomorrow in Cape Town because it might require me to fly from 
my residence in Pretoria have to go to the airport, which needs money and a car, and I have to fly, which needs money. I have to be there and I need accommodation. So I cannot do such things without being considerate of my resources. So it is important that the strategy has to make sense, and it makes sense when we are considering the organization's resources. And essentially, it then brings us to the point of when we make strategic decisions, the strategic decisions are constrained and they need to be what? They need to fulfill certain aspects, they need to be influenced and they are limited by certain things. And that's one thing we need to understand. For instance, you might have a good plan and just going back to personal again, you might have a good plan of what you want to do. You might say that I, I just want a holiday lying at the beach today for an entire week, but you will be constrained because you've got a job. You will need to then take leave. You will need to make sure that it's an appropriate time to take leave. And therefore, you'll need to be mindful about your manager who will need to sign off on what? On that leave. So that is something that we will need to be mindful when we deal with strategic decisions, that they will be affected by those who have power within and around the organization. And we've already spoken about what? We have already spoken about uh, the fact that it is affected by the scope of the organization's activities. We don't just desire to do things that really don't affect us or will not help us to get to where we want to go. And also we are constrained by the fact that we have limited resources. And it, it might be that we are launching something, a product, and this product we might then want to sell it across. But we might then need to say, oh, wait, there is competition. There are suppliers that we need to be mindful of. And these require these things, and therefore we will not be able to, what, to achieve that. So, so in our idea of devising that plan, what I want you to be able to see is that, yes, the plan is that cost of action to take us from here to there but it does not happen in vacuum. It happens in context and the context will restrict us. You might know that the best way to do this is X, but because you don't have the resources, but because the government will not allow you, because you don't have the licenses, because you don't have, or the competitors might respond this way, then it might what? It might therefore limit how you think about that. So we need to be mindful that strategic planning happens in context, and these are some of those characteristics right here. But if we are saying that strategy is really it's a, the, 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 the scope or the direction to some long term objective, should we bother ourselves with that? As an organization, as a professional as well, should we then be mindful about, say, five years' time? Or we should see things as it goes and say, ah, no, let me just apply for this job. I'll see where it uh, lends me. Or is there value of saying that, no, where I want to be, I want to be a director in five years' time. I want to be a partner in five years' time. I want this. Is there any value of companies thinking about that way? Where now they've got these long-term strategies. Then uh, the next thing will then be what? Will then be to understand, therefore, the advantages and the disadvantages of formal planning. So if we are to think about the advantages of long-term formal planning, is that it will then help the managers to think ahead. Because when they think ahead, they might anticipate changes in the market and be able to say that, guys, I know, oh, we are starting to see people behaving in this particular way. We are now seeing 
that the youth are getting access to phones. We cannot be in a world where we don't offer our products through digital platforms. We are here and so on. So the idea of formal long-term planning, it helps managers to look ahead. And it also helps to say that if this is our plan for the next five years, when we are busy completing year one, year two, we know where we will end up. And therefore it can help us to keep us on track and have what? Have more effective control over our resources and our decision-making capabilities. And if we are clear about where we want to go over the long term, it can also help us to identify what can stop us. Oh, okay. Uh, we want to now be able to sell our products um, in what? In different channels, not just at a retail store. Okay, but we realize that we will need a very robust uh, IT or online platform. And the risk is that people are expensive that have got those expertise. They are difficult to find and it requires so much money to develop such platform. So because now we have identified the key risks related to that, we can start doing what? We can start planning for a contingency to say that, yeah, maybe the way to do this is to not necessarily develop our own platform. Let's jump to platforms that are available out there. Can we be a market participant in, say, uh, take a lot um, marketplace? Can we be at Amazon's marketplace? And so on and so on. Because we are recognizing the need to do something, but the risks of not being able to achieve it, we are seeing them and we can come up with contingency plans. Then, related to being able to identify the risk, as I'm saying, the contingency can give us an opportunity to be creative and to be able to then find alternative plans that will help us to get there, maybe with not so many, so much investment, with limited amount of risk, and so on and so on. So that is very important about the need to undertake long-term planning. And when one thinks about it, it might become a little bit of a shock to say that, but is there something that can be a drawback of that? The drawback sometimes is quite simple. If I put a plan before you and I say, this is our plan for the next five years, then yes, it might help you to keep on track and look ahead. But the problem is that that plan might be wrong. I might have missed something. And there is a risk that you might then do what? You might be fixated on that plan at all costs, resulting in you investing resources in something that is no longer going to be useful. And also, we might get to a point where the plan that I've given you, I, I, I've prepared it based on the information that I knew at the time. And over time, as I grow and get to get more experience, I, I, I'm now what I'm now open to different ideas. But because the plan has been approved, I might also be worried that sure, what if I change now? Uh, the, the team members or the other executives might think I don't know what I'm doing because I'm the one who made them approve budgets against this plan. I cannot go back and say, hey, guys, I want to change the plan after the process be done. So there could be those kind of things. And in some cases, the plan could be a five-year plan, but I need to start hitting targets now and so on. And it could be that for this plan to materialize, I need to invest, 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 invest. And maybe in year three, I'll start seeing the what? The fruits. So if I then start seeing the fruits in year three, then I might be a little bit discouraged now during the investment period that I'm doing all this work now, but there are no results. And even there might be cost related to it that I have to suffer. 
Year two, year three, it can that be in such a what? In such a state. So that could then be when I'm under pressure to meet the needs in what? In short term. And therefore, be worried about having a long term plan. And another thing about um, this is that one, it could be to say that, yeah, this plan that we have put together, where does it come from? Oh, it comes from Renan, but do we trust that Rendani knows his work very well? What if Rendani doesn't uh, understand something very well? And, and you might have experienced it in twerk, where now someone is telling you how to go or where they need to do, and you might be thinking that, guys, we have done this before and this thing never works. So this person might not even know about how to get there. And because of that, you then lose confidence in the plan that's before you. So that is the problem with having long-term plans. That one, there could be short-term pressures, the plans could be wrong, they could have been prepared using limited information, um, they, they, they could be rigidity in terms of just following the plans at all costs, and it could be that to develop that plan might require consultants, and it's such an expensive what? Exercise. We have heard so many times about the likes of McKinsey, the likes of Bain, and so on. Then it could be a management distrust about them not trusting the process that goes into it. Or it could simply be that there are just so many hands and this plan is struggling to what? To satisfy those hands and is just then all over the show. It's either too confusing or it's too narrow and therefore it does not have the buy-in. So those are some of the things that we need to understand about what? Long-term planning. That it is important for us to have a long-term plan, but there could be disadvantages related to such a formal long-term planning approach. So that is the kind of things that we will need to be mindful of. So one is to take away that we are understanding that strategy is a cause of plan, taking into account the resources that we need in order to achieve our objective. And generally, when we talk about strategy, we're talking about long term. And it is the objectives are likely to be informed by our stakeholders. And strategy happens in a context where there will be constraints because of the stakeholders that have got power, the resources that we've got, the um, uh, the, 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 the participants that are in the market and so on. Then additionally, uh, we are recognizing that yes, but having a plan in the long term can be advantageous or to some extent it could be what? It could be limiting. So those are the first building blocks of strategy. Then now, Let's look at the different strategies. Because you, when you were making an example earlier, you made up an example about strategies that could be from, say, Monday to Friday. But in organization, we then find different types of strategies. So some are very broad strategies that are translated to what? To divisions. And then some are then further pushed down into what? Into functional or day-to-day -day kind of approach. So that kind of thinking gives us three levels of strategies. The first one is what we call a corporate strategy. Second, a business strategy. And third or finally, a functional strategy. 
So the corporate strategy, it is that strategy that examine the strategies of the organization as a whole. So, so this is the entire organization. If we are talking about an audit fair, we are talking about the entire strategy of the audit firm. But we understand that in the audit firm, there are sectors or clusters. There might be the retail cluster, there might be the social and security cluster, there might be an economic cluster, there might be a mining uh, sector and retail sector and so on. So that will now move us to business strategy. But as you can imagine, the corporate strategy will then focus on what? On giving us clarity on which businesses and markets we need to operate in. So it will give us clarity in terms of that. Is our focus going to be in the public sector? Is our focus going to be in the private sector? Is our focus going to be uh, in non-assurance activity or assurance activity. So the corporate strategy will then be like that. So the corporate strategy will then give us those kind of what responses. And if we are saying that we need to be in, say, the public sector, and we only have, say what, only have private sector clients, we might then need to say we need to set up a new division or we need to buy another company that has got very good exposure. So those things are at a corporate level. They are usually what the board will be dealing with on a day to day. So not on a day to day, but when they are driving the strategies of the company, corporate strategies. Then after that, the strategies will be handed down to the company. And the company will say, oh, no, we've had what the board wants to do. We have what we have decided that we will be focusing on building our non-assurance revenue. Um, and we will do so by doing tax consulting. We will then do um, valuation consulting and due diligence consulting. So we are clear about the markets in which we're going to be operating uh, in. And therefore, we need to then say, for us to win in that non-assurance market, what do we have to do? And that's when we talk about business strategy. So business strategy will be essentially the corporate strategy, then filtered down to a divisional or business unit level. And therefore, here we'll be thinking about the things that will help us to achieve competitive advantage over similar companies or over similar divisions of competitors. And we will also want to understand what will be the things that competitors can do and limit our success. So this is what we are then concerned about. Then we will focus on strategic business unit, and these are the units that will have an external market. So let, let's make a, a distinction between business and functional. So when we talk about business, so a business, yeah, we are talking about like a mini division or a mini company. Like in my example, I'm talking about the non-assurance division of the tax consultant you've started. So it will have external clients maybe that need assistance with VAT, that need assistance with uh, corporate income tax and so on. So that is that. Then next, we will then have a functional or operational level strategy. And that will then uh, be what? that will then be for the marketing division, the HR, and so on. So here it could be that the corporate strategy is to make sure uh, that we, we, we enter this um, 
tax consulting space. And we have identified that we're going to need uh, great people, competent people, experienced and very strong academic, uh, strong candidates academically when it comes to tax law. Then what will then happen is that that will then be given to the HR. So HR will now need to come to put with the day to day of how do they go about attracting and retaining those people that will support the business strategy. And in turn, when the business strategy is successful, support the corporate strategy. So these are then the levels of strategies that exist. Where we are saying corporate, the entire organization, business, strategic business unit, and lastly, function being the functional units focused on day-to-day -day management strategies. And as you will see the point there, it says, we will then be concerned when it comes to functional level, at a functional level, we'll be concerned at how the components of the organization, in terms of resources, people, processes, are pulled together to form a strategic architecture which will effectively deliver the overall strategic direction. And the typical decision we can see that it's the human resource strategy, the marketing strategy, IT and IS strategy, as well as what? Operations strategy. So this is what we are talking about when we talk about the different levels of what? The different levels of strategies. So any questions or any point at this particular point? A point in time. Does that does the different levels of strategy make sense? Okay. Great. Then now. Let's look at the types of strategies. So the types of strategies. So we have come to understand what is a strategy. One, we have seen the different levels at which strategy can happen. Now, what about the types of strategies? So when we talk about the different types of strategies, we have four types of strategies that we're going to be focused on. It is the one that I was saying that you will have been exposed and be most familiar with, the rational model. Then you will have the emergent approach, which, as the name suggests, it emerges from somewhere. So we're going to understand how does it emerge? Then the logical incrementalism. So here we will then see that we are afraid of doing something that is too radical. We just want to make the small change. And freewheeling opportunism is, let's go with the flow. So these are the four types of strategies that we're going to discuss. And you might need to keep in mind which we're going to come back to. So as we discuss this, and uh, as we discuss these strategies, which one will you choose? And I want to hear your, your, your view once we, we are done. Which one do you think is the best? Which one should be applied? And which one have you seen been applied, say, at where you work or in your own company? So let's start with our most familiar one. So the most familiar one is what we call the rational model. And as the name suggests, rational means like it's logical. So it's logical. So this is the logical step-by-step -step approach which requires the organization to analyze its existing circumstances, generate 
possible strategies and select the best ones and then implement them. And that's what you guys were saying. So you were talking about the rational model. And that's why we say this is the logical step-by-step -step approach. Because traditionally, or oh, thinking about it, people tend to start here when they develop strategies. How so? How do I know that you were talking about this? Because when I asked you, you told me that you will start by knowing where you want to go. And essentially, that's what we call mission and objectives. That's how you are thinking about. So you are thinking about the rational model. Right? That's where you start. Mission and objective. What are we looking to do? What do we, what defines us? Who do we want to do it for? How do we want to do it? So, so, so not how, but what is it? So, so it starts with the mission and objectives. Then you said a very important line, uh, Seymour, right there. Uh, when you said that we then look at what we have, where we are, and that's what we call position and appraisal. So position and appraisal. Oh, okay. So what does a position and appraisal do? It simply says that how much money do I have in the bank account? Do I have the right people? Do I have the right reputation? Do I have the right expertise? And so on and so on. You are just doing a position analysis, looking at yourself and judging. Oh, yes, I've got money in my bank account, but is it enough to do this? So that's what position and appraisal is all about. But when you look at the errors, you don't only look at yourself. Do you see that when I'm asking about the money, my reputation, I'm talking about things that are internal, that are, are about me. Do I have the skills and expertise about me as an organization? Do I have the money about me? Do I have the people about me? But we can see that it's not only about that. There is another arrow coming from below, which says, external environment. So the external environment means that when we do this analysis, we also consider the outside that now I want to do this. That's my plan. But the petrol is expensive. That's not about me. It's just the reality. Petrol is expensive. The interest rates are high. The, the, the competition is very tough out there. The customers are under pressure. People are losing jobs. Um, the, the technology is not available. The, 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 the suppliers don't have the material. They're under constraint. They are not able to import. We are having issues with Transnet and therefore not being able to, 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 to import or deliver or get our things out because of the airports and the rail. So that's the outside. So this position and appraisal does not only look at just us. It looks at both us and the things that are outside but affecting us. In other words, the things that are beyond our control. And as, we, as I was making an example of the things, I hope you will now say that, but oh wait, that sounds like a pastel because you are telling us about uh, the interest rates, which is the economic factors. You are telling us about people not having jobs, economic factors, about the 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 the, the, the youth in the industry that that's social. You are telling us about technological factors. You are telling about competitive forces in the pastel, about the customers, about the suppliers, about the competition. So that is how we will then be unpacking some of those things later on. So when we do position and appraisal, we'll be looking at both internal and external factors. Then I, I have my objectives. I have done my analysis. That's when I can come up and start saying that, all right, in order for me to achieve those things, I can do it through one, two, three, four, 
Fine. So you then come up with the plans. You have them there. So, so at this point, you are busy listing all those plans. You are saying, these are my plans. I can buy another company. I can start this thing from scratch. I can get into a joint arrangement. I can go into this market. So you are busy listing the options. But you have done an appraisal analysis. You have told me about your plans. So all these plans that you have, are they going to be uh, mindful of those things that we've spoken about? And that's where now the next step comes in. Evaluation and choice. So now you had just done an analysis of your bank account and you found that you only have 100 million left. And if you had to buy another company, companies are expensive. They are starting at about 250 million. So that strategy won't work. Then should you do it and start it internally? But you don't have the people that know how to do this. All right, but can I hire them? Oh, you can possibly hire them. Oh, OK, maybe we need to hire them. So this strategy makes sense. Then what about the other one of starting partnership with others? Starting partnership, uh, you are finding that you are the smallest and the only big companies are there. So it will be very difficult for someone to listen to you and start a partnership. So no partnership is out. So that's evaluating and choosing strategies. And in doing so, you will then consider your position an appraisal to say that, no, I cannot be thinking about selling things that are very expensive. The economy is tough now. If now I'm to then do something that requires quite a lot of petrol, I know this will not work because people are already under pressure from this high petrol pricing. All right. I am worried about things that uh, buying a machine that uses a lot of electricity. Because I am worried about load shading, I'll need to buy a generator if I do this. So that's what we are thinking about. Then we'll also be mindful of what? Of the people that we had considered when we were devising our mission and objectives. How so? That we want to, or maybe we had a public um, incentive. And we then, our public incentive is what? Our public incentive is such that we want to make the vaccine accessible to even people that don't work. Uh, that was one of our objectives. But then when we come here, we are finding that in order to do so, this thing is expensive and we'll need to charge. But it's not appropriate because our objective is to make this as accessible as possible. So some of the things will not necessarily be unsuitable because of internal and external environment. They might be inappropriate because of the objectives that we're looking to achieve. But all these things, that's what the entire E3 is all about. That's why I said these are the foundations. Then once we have decided on the strategy, we then get to work. Let's implement. We are busy working. We are hiring people that we said we need. We are constructing that factory. And therefore, things like project management are starting to be crucial. People management are starting to be crucial. Now, year one has gone down. How have we done? Then we jump to step number, the next step, which is review and control. We realize that, sure, we missed the mark significantly. So in terms of controlling, it could be we hire the wrong people. So let's let them go and hire the right people. Or oh, it could be that we had underestimated the cost of a particular strategy. Should we go back and evaluate the other strategies that we thought could not work and maybe look at them? So that's why review and control works best backwards to say that after we've reviewed, we can actually go back and change our implementation plan. Or we can go back and choose a different strategy. Or we can go back and start what? Looking for more options in order to achieve our objectives. And this goes back and forth. See, when we are reviewing, we are checking that were we wrong about 
the customers? Were we wrong about our competitors? Were we wrong about who we, we are? Maybe we thought that we had a brilliant CEO and the CEO left the organization. Uh, maybe we thought we had a good resource and the government has now uh, taken that without, appropriate, without compensation. So it could be a number of things under review and control. That's why it then goes back to the internal and external environment because if I want to know what went wrong, I need to start from there. So do you see that even when you talk about this, that this makes sense? And that's the name, the rational model of strategy development. This makes sense. Any questions with the rational model before we talk about the next one? But the, 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 the syllabus E3, um, it's based on the rational model, and that's what we're going to spend our time on. So, so I'll want you to, to then do it. I'll want you to then have what? A good understanding of that. Does that make sense? Any question, high level? Remember, we're going to go into the detail later on, but I just want it to make sense so that it does not feel forced later on when we break it down, because we're going to break down. So if maybe I, I'm here, let me just go back to the chapters. So just going back to the chapters, look at it. So, so look at the. So we had we've got chapter eight strategic choices and what strategic options and choices. Then we've got chapter seven framework for generating strategic option. We've got chapter eight, you know, nine, ten, and eleven strategic control. So do you see that the rest of E three, it's about what? It's about this, and we've got external environmental analysis. We've got resources and value creation. So this, it's all about the rational model. So we are we good? Do we have any question about the logics, the logic of it at this point? I'm so sorry for my side, Rindan. Thank you. Still coming. Sure. But then, is this the only way to develop a strategy? Or maybe before we do that. So, so, so Johnson Schools and um, is it Wington? They, they then looked at that and said, essentially, if you think about the rational model of strategy, it can be captured in three things. That there is a strategic analysis that we do, then the strategic choice and strategic implementation. So when we talk about strategic analysis, we are really talking about what? We are really talking about identifying the opportunities and threats and identifying the strengths and weaknesses, which is part of the position and appraisal. We are developing objectives, and I said objectives needs to consider the stakeholders. So stakeholder analysis to identify key objectives their power as well as interest. And we are also identifying the opportunities that exist so that when we choose the strategies, we choose the one that makes sense. Then strategic choice essentially do that to say, we are going to choose the strategies that require us to close that gap. Then we're gonna develop a competitive strategy for a business unit and the direction for growth as well as how that growth will be what? Will be pursued. Then strategic implementation. Now we look at the formulation of detailed plans and budgets. And we then have targets, settings where we come up with, how do we know we are winning? Because I said we need to review the plans, but you might say that, but if I'm to review on what the strategy is winning or not, how do I do that? You then have KPIs, key performance indicators, that you will have said that in year one, we need to have employed 10 people, but we're only five, so we're not doing well. We need to have achieved revenue of 100 million, or we've got 120, so we've ticked. So they need to be 
that monitoring and control once we have the KPIs. So that is how you can think alternatively about what? The rational model of strategy development. All right, then the emergent approach. When it comes to the emergent approach, what are we saying? We are now saying that, but this rational model, it has an assumption that the world will be in a particular state. We will assess it and then we'll come back, we'll implement strategies and we'll review them. But the reality is that sometimes the world is not like that. The world changes. And in some cases, it changes faster than in others. Like imagine companies that had a long-term strategy, then COVID broke out. That those companies struggled to survive because they were now fixated. Remember they had those disadvantages of having a long-term plan? that they were fixated on their long-term. And because they had put resources in order to achieve that long-term plan, it became very difficult for them to what? To quickly adapt to changes in the environment. So some people don't like the rational model because of that, that it can be slow and it can quickly become what? Outdated. So then some people therefore suggested, why don't we consider the emergent approach to strategy development? And here we are recognizing that we might be following a rational approach, but that strategy doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, the emergent might not necessarily say that, let's go back to the mission. No, it might say that, what have we learned through this process? Can we just then take this and move ahead with it? So it's not like we are abandoning everything, but it is so open to accepting the evolution of a strategy or thinking in the strategy to be able to look for opportunities in the failure. And the classic example that you will find them they said that, um, what do you call it? Pfizer, the pharmaceutical company, was busy, developed a, a, a drug which they wanted to treat high blood pressure. A, a, and they said that guy, they were committed to developing that. They tested patients. And sadly, they found that that drug did not do what? Did not help with high blood pressure. But on the other hand, it had a very interesting result, such that they later developed that drug into what is known as Viagra right now. And then they've since made billions of money from Viagra. So the idea was that they were open enough to say that, yes, we had developed this and this was our approach. So this didn't work. Let's not invest more resources into fixing that, but let's identify something that is emerged as an opportunity. So that's where the emergent approach comes in, that it was not your original plan, but this just became an opportunity, a reality that you needed to pursue. So that is where we are coming from, that it is not part or an outcome of a logical formal process, but it arose as and when. So essentially, an entity that follows the imagined, they might have some elements of the rational, but they will not necessarily follow that chain that I was explaining or that order. That as they are busy looking or evaluating strategies, they could start seeing an opportunity which they may pursue rather than then say, no, we are going to do this. No, they might change there because they found now a new opportunity that might produce some significant results. 
So, so that's what then the emergency says that we had a plan, but we are open to changing the plan or to allowing the plan to evolve based on new information uh, or changes in the environment. So that means we will be open to change with the emergent. Then the logical incrementalism takes it a step further. Oh, no, so, no, so it, it then says that, sure, but we are assuming that management are always going to be approving significant strategies. But it then questions that really, do managements do that every year and or every five years they've got this bold strategy that they need to pursue. So this thing then says, no, no, it might not be true. It might be that management don't even have the time and the information to make these bold decisions each and every year. Because they're always afraid that bold decisions, are, like they could be clear that there is an opportunity there. But to op pursue that opportunity requires quite a lot more. I need to then uh, make sure that I've got a new division, I've got management, I then oriented my customer, so it could be a big shift. And they might not be open to putting in the way, or they just don't have the resources to put in the work. But they realize that they need to be, what? They need to be changes for them to continue to what? To adapt. So this will then be a situation of what? A situation where now, for instance, this company started out, say, as what? Um, uh, it started out as, um, yeah, as a maybe milk company. Then they realized that, oh, okay, we've got milk here, and, and then we sell milk. Maybe what we can do, there is the, 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 the milk that it's, uh, what do you call it? Then with milk, then there is a byproduct. This byproduct, we can make yogurt from it. So they will then start making yogurt. But it does not require a fundamental shift or a, a, them to do much more than the, what they were doing. So they have got this plan of theirs, but now something uh, can be done in order to enhance. So there is a small scale kind of approach to developing strategy. And if now I'm seeing that actually this was a byproduct from my milk production, when I introduce it to people, that is more likely to be acceptable because they know that I will still be doing our main product. It's just now we will now introduce this, maybe start packaging it uh, before we make it large scale. So there is a need to then do it, do this small scale extension. But it's not radical. It's not like we're doing milk and we're going to be doing juice tomorrow. And therefore, we now say we require fruits and we require new suppliers of fruits. No, we, we are just busy doing this. And this then this kind of small scale kind of approach. And some call it what? Value add products. So I could have been, uh, then what? I could have gotten into a business of selling eggs. Then small scale is that the, when the chickens are no longer of age to produce, uh, what uh, X, then I need to slaughter them. Then let me start selling chicken. Oh, I'm selling chicken. Uh, maybe let me start opening a chisanyama where I buy. So you can see that uh, the strategy, the, it is there, but it is what on a small scale that once I've gotten a formula, I'm able to what to implement it forward. So that is the what logical incrementalism. So when you look at it, the, the, the employees, the managers, they, they, they find it that it makes sense for us to do this. It's not like we are doing something fundamentally different where now we were saying we had a, a hatchery and we were producing eggs. Now we want to sell beef. No, no, that'll be too much of a change. We are just 
now it's like we are in the same value chain kind of process. So that is the logical incrementalism. So the advantage is that it requires less of a culture shift and it is likely to be more acceptable to your stakeholders. But the problem is, the, do you have a long-term plan or you just always do these small changes? Yes, they might work, but is there a long-term plan that you can put? Is all these things that you're doing having been planned before? Then the last one, which is the freewheeling optionism. So as the name suggests, here it's like we are going with the flow. We are going with the flow. And it generally is suitable when the people are very smart, they know their work. So going with the flow means that we don't have a detailed formal plan. If now I wake up and then someone gives me a call and say there's a position I'm in. I'm in if there's more money. Uh, it's like I take advantages of the opportunities that come. So, 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 but what if it's not aligned to the bigger plan, but I don't have that bigger plan. I just want to work. I'm just a CA and I had when I started this career that CAs make money and this is going to give me money. I'm happy. But don't you want to? No, 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 no. Uh, it's all about what taking advantage of opportunities as they come. And in some cases, um, it, it can make sense. I mean, some of these things can blow up to be very great company, um, like the likes of Instagram. Uh, maybe if you think about like WhatsApp, you just wanted people to chat. You didn't have a bigger plan, but then someone saw that bigger plan and acquired you and are able to do what? Are able to then use your resource or your expertise in a fundamental way. But you just started and say, I want people to talk to each other. This thing of calling is just not working. So there is a need for you to develop a product. I want people to connect with themselves, with each other, regardless of where they are. Let me develop an app, call it Facebook. Now it's grown. But initially we are saying that there was no formal plan of Facebook will grow to be this and this and that and that. We are just recognizing that this thing just blew up. But it was out of an opportunity we identified. So the problem though is if we don't have a plan, we know that we'll not be able to do it to identify risks. And because nothing is guiding us, whatever that comes, we can go with it. If someone then says, oh, no, this chat platform, we can incorporate it here, let's go with it. Uh, why not? Because there's no bigger plan or vision about this thing. And investors don't like that too, because if you try to ask them for money, they'll say, oh, what's your plan? And you're like, I oh, know this is just a great air. People love it. But no, 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 no. Where are we taking this? So we give you this money. What is tomorrow? This tomorrow story about this app. So those could be some of the issues. And if you don't have people that are experienced, it can be frustrating for them to follow through on your plan. So those are some of the things that we want to be mindful of. And that uh, talks to us about what? The th three or four um, types of strategies. So number one, it is what? So number one, it is um, the rational model. Two, the logical, um, so the imagined approach, three, logical incrementalism. And number four, it is what? It is the free willing optionism. So those are the three, four types of strategies that we need to be mindful of. Any questions? Still sorted on Nandex. Yes. Great. 
So now the question is, we now know the different levels of strategies, the types of strategies, and now what are the different perspectives to strategic planning? And as I'm saying, sometimes it's the terminology, but again, there's logic to it. So when I put my strategy, what informs the way I think about it? This is how you need to think about perspectives to strategic planning. So now, there are three ways to think about my strategies. I could think about it from stakeholders' perspective. What do my people want? What do my people want? All right, they want me to generate as much money as possible. They want me to deliver this product at the lowest cost as possible. They want me to, so, so that's where I start. So, so now I've got all these objectives, but this way of doing it, could be limiting. So you are saying that I just want to be what? To be a CFO with this designation. But what we are concerned about there is there are other people that want to be C CFOs for the same role in the same company. Are you taking those into account? So that is where we are saying that Sometimes we could forget that there are competitors that are either delivering this thing at a much cheaper play rate, or they are not even achieving those margins that you're talking about. And it becomes um, both useful for a non-profit organization, but the problem is that they are usually quite a lot of stakeholders, and therefore too many conflicting objectives. So with this particular approach, as we are saying, you are mindful that whatever you do when you develop a strategy, you are trying to please others, your stakeholders. But because we are worried about the fact that their needs might not be market-oriented, and we, we normally do this about what we normally hear uh, this when it comes to to say um, negotiating salaries, that when you negotiate salaries, sometimes we we will then be worried about that. But the salaries that have been demanded, uh, the company is not making money, um, and it will then increase. Like let's say about ESCOM, we have then seen ESCOM uh, being under the pressure to what to increase salaries and packages for its employees to not uh, retrench. But if then ESCOM pursues that objective, then there is a problem because market-wise, it means that it will need to increase the tariff and it will be harming the economy, it will be harming the consumer when there are increases in its tariff, um, in its electricity tariff. So that's what we are talking about when you say a stakeholder approach, that we are focused on satisfying our stakeholders with how we develop our strategies. But it could be that we now need to be market, more market-oriented and say that this, what, whatever you are, we want to do, will it still make us to be more competitive what will the competitors do if we do X? Will they not do Y and we are then limited? Maybe if we increase the price, they might reduce their prices and we'll struggle to sell. So therefore we will need to then say in developing our strategies, we need to understand the environment and therefore make sure that our strategy fits into that environment. But what if then the environment keeps on changing? 
Like right now, we are going to have elections. How do you now have a strategy that fits? Because the election might mean new power lay after the what after the elections and new policies. So should you then be focused on an external approach when you are developing your strategies? Lastly, you might say, no, let me not do that. Let me just focus on what I do best. OK, so what do you do best? Uh, when it comes to X, you cannot touch me. Like even when I'm applying for interview, I will then tell you that I pay attention to detail. That I'm very good at. I am a critical thinker. That I'm good at. I, 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 I am able to bring people together. You're going to need that for some of your major, major projects. That is my competence. So it's a competence-led approach. So we develop strategies around what we have. And because we've got smart people, because we've got ability to attract people, we are then able to develop strategies that are what? That are aligned to that. So this is just a perception. A perception. So we are applying say, the rational, but what is influencing our thinking? That's what this kind of talks to. That's what we mean when you talk about perspectives to strategic planning. Is it a stakeholder approach? Is it a positioning uh, or market-led approach? Or is it a resource or competence-led approach? When you apply for jobs, what do you do? Like for instance, do you go and look for the most paying job? Meaning that you take what? You take a market-led approach? Or do you go and say that I've been, I did my articles in audit, I worked in a particular firm before, I studied for this and that, and therefore this is what I'm good at, so let me apply for this job, where we talk about resource-based. No, I want to apply for jobs that will keep me close to my family. That is a stakeholder approach. Do you see that in everything you're applying for a job, but the way you are doing it, it's different. There are different perspectives, stakeholder, market-led, and resource-based. So that is what we are talking about when we talk to perspectives to strategic planning. All right. Any questions before we go on a break? So, and that is just some of what? That is some of the groundwork. And because remember that in the objective test, you will be required to um, remember and know things. You might be asked, so what are um, uh, 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 so because it's a strategy one, they might say that um, a company uh, wanted to 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 uh, has been approached um, by another competitor. Uh, the competitor um, want I uh, wanted us to, to to form a joint venture. Um, and in forming a joint venture, uh, we will then be able to share expertise. Uh, and then they will ask you what type uh, or at what level of strategic decision making will this be at? Will it be at a corporate level? Will it be at a business unit level? Will it be at a functional level? So they will want you to know and understand these things know and understand them. Then they might say that we we wanted to um we wanted to enter into a new market and in the new market uh, this market um is in consulting the text consulting example we used and we believe that in our marketing we need to emphasize um, 
the number of CAs uh, that are in the team, the number of uh, associate chartered management accountant that are in the team, the number of people that have got said uh, as a uh, thing, what kind of percept perception to strategic planning are we taking? Are we taking a stakeholder? Are we taking a market led? Are we taking a competence led approach? So do you see how then these things can be asked? But right now at this point, I want you to understand them so well, so that when you start doing questions, it starts making sense. So with that, do you have anything you want to clarify? Because that is essentially chapter one. But I want you to be able to see how then all these things, they test them. And some of them are much easier. They could say that um, we, we started um, with what? We started uh, with um, like thinking about Amazon. Amazon started with selling um, books online. And when they started selling books online, uh, they realized that people want to buy more stuff. Uh, and then they decided to then ask people to say, what would you want to buy on our Amazon store? Then people started listing and then they started uh, listing those stuff on their what? On their, on their, on their website. And the question could be, what type of strategy um, approach is it? Is it a rational? Is it an emergent? Is it freewheeling or logical incrementalism? So those are the kind of things that you can expect. So those are the kind of things that you can expect. So I just wanted to make that clear. So if there are no questions, we can do a, what time is it? Nineteen forty-nine. We can come back at five past. Let's come back at five past eight. Thank you.